is Brian Moshegadi. I'm born again. Jesus Christ is a solid rock on which I stand. It is the honor of my life to serve God and his people here at DC Zima, here at the Shiloh um, Worship Center, and a Bishop Dr. Jimmy and Pastor Alice Kimani, who are not in today, but they send their love. Do you receive it? Munapokea salamu za wazazi jamani. Even ndio mtasalimika mkisalimiwa na watu wanaopenda. Bas ndio. All right, we bless the Lord, we bless the Lord. We want to get into our sharing today with the little time that we have and just move it along. And we are reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11. And it is a long portion of scripture. We have about 30 verses to try and cover. Um, maybe we'll not go through them one after the other. I know you had 30, some of you are just like, I did that. But we are going to go through them, maybe not verse for verse or word for word, but we'll try and see how far we can get in the time that the Lord allows us. And my working title today is Come to Jesus. Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to read just a couple of verses. I'm going to skip along as we move. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in the cities. And when John, the Baptist, had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the one coming, or do we look for another? Jesus said and said to them, Go and tell John the things that you hear from me, that the things that you also see, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And so they departed, and Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? prophet and he said to them yes i say to you and more than a prophet for this is he of whom it is written behold i see my messenger before your face he who will prepare your way before you assuredly jesus continues i say to you among those who are born of women there has not reason one that is greater than john the baptist but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he and from the days of john the baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent Take it by force. For all the prophets and all the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then Jesus talks to them about where they are, asking them about the generation that they find themselves in and telling them, he's just commending John. By way of commending John, he instructs them and gives them a couple of things. And then he speaks concerning some of these cities that are there who had heard about him and seen him in their midst. We'll go into that in a little bit of detail. But he starts to speak to them about the cities that were right there who had spoken and heard and so on and so forth. Um, but they spoke against it. They did not accept him. They did not uh, settle in to what Jesus was doing in their midst. Then he continues now to speak about the rest that he gives. And he says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, the Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Then in 28, he says to them, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. Uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We pray that you will shed your light upon your word into every heart today and into every mind that we may comprehend, that we may see you, that we may hear you clearly, that we may get the conviction of your spirit today and that we may do the things that you're calling us to do. Because we pray these things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Like we said, that is 30 verses that we are going to try and get into that are speaking about really the same thing, but we are trying to go and get into all of them. So by this time, as is always our custom to do, to just get a little bit of what is happening. Jesus has already come into the earth. These things he's doing in his earthly ministry. By this time, he's already, um, he's already come and he's already been baptized 
um, I think in Matthew chapter 4, before there, he's already been baptized. He's done a lot of things. There have been signs and miracles and wonders. Jesus has been doing the things that he came to do. You can find what Jesus came to do in Luke chapter 4 and 18, which is really our anchor verse for Deliverance Church all around. Okay? They're saying that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me too, and Jesus lists out the things he came to do. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. If you are lost, because this is the youth service, ukisiki umepote ya mahali, ukiinuwa mkono, tutarudi nyuma. Sawa, sawa. Tutunataka kusonga pamoja. All right, so by this time, he's done all these things. By this time, John the Baptist has been put in prison. Okay? We read there in verse uh, 2. It says, and when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent some of his disciples. Now, something that we find here, John was the cousin of Jesus Christ. If we go back to the time that the birth of Jesus Christ is announced, before that, there's a woman who had already been told about the birth of Jesus Christ. Not the birth of Jesus, about the birth of her own child, Mama John. Elizabeth. So Elizabeth and her husband, Baba John, was called? That's right, Zachariah. So Elizabeth and Zachariah were devout. They were old. They did not have a child, okay? Elizabeth was barren. John was old. Both of them were old, and Elizabeth was barren. So there were hardly any chances of them getting a child, okay? So they waited upon God. They had waited upon God. Elizabeth was coming from a priestly lineage. Um, her husband was a priest himself. And so they had waited, and, you know, no, it was no longer coming. So they started to just trust God for the redemption of Israel. All of Israel, by the way, by this point, are waiting for the redemption of Israel. They are waiting that the Lord is going to come, that God is going to do what he had promised to do, to come and liberate them. So they are waiting on the Lord for him to do something. So the story goes that the Lord, um, through his angel, appears to her husband when he's inside there doing the thing that they were supposed to be doing. The Lord appears to her husband. The husband doubts. He no longer can speak. He comes out, has to sign to his wife, you and me tonight going down. We're going to get a child. Signs to the woman and let's know um, that God has spoken and said something that needs to happen. Okay. So Elizabeth gets pregnant because... I mean, God had promised, and she went, she goes away by herself for five months, just recounting the goodness of the Lord, okay? So, while she's out there, the angel appears to Mary, and says to Mary that, because these things I'm telling you are difficult, so Mary had not had, um, Mary was betrothed, so engaged, really. Mary was engaged to her man, her man whose name was Joseph, that's right. So, she was engaged to Joseph, but they were not doing the deed, you know, how it's supposed to be done? Oh, this is the youth service. We have to say these things. So they were not doing the deed. They were staying pure because you were supposed. To, it, was, it was supposed to be that way, and it still is supposed to be that way, okay? Just because they were engaged doesn't mean that they had now been given a license to do that thing until they were finally married. This thing is not for people who are not married. Say my amen. Say my amen, Yanguvu. Amen. Wonderful. So um, they... they we were not doing the deed, um, but the angel appeared to Mary and said to her, you're going to get a child, and um, you know, you're blessed are you among all women. And it was confusing because, great, it's so nice to be picked out, hand-picked by God to carry God. But also, there's the community, there's the villagers, there's the people who will say, Ati, she was a virgin girl. Virgin sangapi na yo. Anataka kutombia ni nini yo ni tiuma? So, that was what was happening. So, the angel appears to Mary and says to her, Cheki, your relative Elizabeth is also out there nursing some great impossible things that God has now made possible in her life. So, you, Mary decides, I'm going to go in the company of those who God is doing great things to. And so, she goes out to the hill country and visits her. When Mary meets Elizabeth, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. Elizabeth immediately knows this one is carrying my Lord. Who am I? The Lord has favored me this way. Now a second time. That on top of being pregnant in my old age, now I would also greet the mother of my Lord. Oh, what a wonderful time it is. So that just to explain that these two people were related. Okay. So John, 
na Jesus. Now, they were around peers. Their age difference is about five, six months, if you read it right there. About five, six months, okay? So they were peers. Sawa. So he needed to be a peer. He needed to come there. We'll not talk about it, uh, that right now. But God needed that the birth of John the Baptist was delayed so that it can really coincide with the coming of Jesus Christ. Because somebody needed to be there, to be a forerunner, to go out and prepare the way of the Lord. Are there some delays happening in your life? Consider that there may be, it may be that the Lord is allowing them the delays to come just so that they can coincide with something else because God sees the grand picture of things. When you, you are thinking here now, immediately, I want it by right now, by fire, by force. God is saying, I know that, but I know you need it in a time when I also need it to come together with something else. So if you're in the house and you're battling with delay, consider that the Lord is there behind the scenes, just holding things until the right time. Just until the right time. If you watch National Geographic, by this time they should already be giving us endorsements because we mention them a lot. If you watch National Geographic, you find when they are looking at when you're looking at animals who are um, lions who are hunting, what do they do? They lie in wait. They lie in wait. They are waiting for the two gazelles to go. You are wondering if it were you, if you were the lion, if the lion was running on your software, you would pounce on the first gazelle that appears. The first zebra that crosses, you are just like, ha, kabla ipote, nyama. But they are passing in droves. But the lion is not like you. Blessed be God. If it were like us, they would be hungry, dead, all of them. But the lion is lying in wait, just waiting for the right time. Any time too early and you scare the rest of them and you miss this one. Any time too late and all of them have passed. So you wait, you just lie in wait. When the time is right, sometimes you, li you look at it, you're wondering, what is it doing? It's going to miss its lunch. It's going to miss just pounce. They're just about to pass. They're just about to pass. Sometimes they even stand. The gazelles are standing or the zebras are standing and they look around. They're wondering, I smell lion around, but I can't see it. Huh? Anyway, it's just in my mind. The lion is just there, just there. When the time is right, then it pounces. Now, if that wisdom can be in animals and beasts, how much more in God who makes all these things? God knows a little bit too early and it will ruin you. A little bit too late and that will be destruction. So at the right time, the Bible reminds us, when the time is right, I, the Lord, would do what? Would make it happen. If you're waiting on the Lord, tell your neighbor, wait some more. You got to hang in there. So anyway, the relative of Jesus, John the Baptist has already come and he's baptized Jesus. He's been the forerunner. John the Baptist knows that this is the Messiah. And Jesus knows that he is the Messiah. Because at the baptism in Matthew 4 or Luke 4, you will find that there is a dove who, which ascends and the opens heaven and we hear a voice from God. The voice is saying what? We have to preach together. This is my beloved son, my son, son who I love and in him... I am well pleased. Okay, so the, the heavens open. So Jesus is affirmed right there by God. So Jesus has no doubt that he is the Messiah. John has no doubt before that that Jesus is the Messiah. But something interesting happens when John has been thrown in prison. Maybe we might need to ask ourselves why John was thrown in prison. Let me give you an answer to why John was thrown in prison. Now, um, the king around that time is Herod. Herod Antipas of Galilee uh, pays a visit to his brother in Rome. During that visit, this man comes and seduces his brother's wife. I know. Scandalous. Comes and seduces his brother's wife. He comes home again, he dismisses his own wife, and then he marries his sister-in-law, whom he had lured away from her husband. Such drama in the scriptures. So when he's amefukuza mke wake, amekuja amechukua mke wa ndugu yake, amemleta kwa nyumba. Now, when John the Baptist heard about these things, he publicly and sternly rebuked Herod. Now, in those days, it was not safe. Just like even in this day, it is not safe. You can't just go out and start speaking against the kings. Uh, forget about now in this country where we are living and where we have so much freedom. You can just make memes about the president. I mean... You, you just, mm -mm. there are places where you cannot speak against the leader. There are places where you cannot speak against the king. In those days, it was even worse. They could not afford to speak against the king. But John, because he knew this is wrong, this is sin, this is atrocious, he speaks loudly and publicly against the king. He says, what you are doing is not a good thing. Herod becomes angry, and because him and the wife, what was her name? Was her name Philippa or something like that? Um, 
him and the wife are very um, petty people, they decide to throw John into prison. So that's how John is in prison, okay? So that's just a little bit of the background. So he's in prison. He's been in prison for a minute by this time. And um, Herod would have killed him only that he was afraid about the crowds. You know, people loved him. People con considered him a prophet. So coming close to him was bad. But if you go to the book of Matthew chapter 14, which we'll not go into right now, you'll find that he found a way around it. He asked for the, he, causes, he allowed the daughter to ask for the head of the king. It's a long story. Matthew chapter 14. I commend it to you to just read it in your own free time. It's interesting. Um, Matthew chapter 14 from verse 3 to 12. You can find it in there. So John has been in prison for a minute. So he asks the question, asking, um, he sent two of his disciples asking, are you the one who is coming or should we wait for another? Now, it is highly likely that John, while he's inside there, is wondering, um, if you truly are the one, remember we had said John had already believed, had already commended Jesus as the Messiah. But while he's in prison in the bit of difficulty, sometimes some doubt begins to creep in. You start to wonder, if he truly is the one, shouldn't he have come to rescue me by now? You know, we are waiting for the Messiah, the one who is coming to rescue Israel. He should come in with force, with pomp and with glamour. He should just be breaking down prison doors, just coming into the prison and saying, ha, release my prophets. You expect that the Messiah, the prophets are on the same side as the Messiah, aren't they? So you expect that he's going to rescue the people who are on his side. Side, I'm an Amnagani. Now, maybe it's a bit difficult understanding it when you think about John the Baptist. Think about yourself. You are working on the same side as Jesus Christ. I'm an Amnagani. When troubles and tribulations are coming to you, you are wondering, ah, 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 ah. Jesus needs to just break down the heavens and come and just do something dramatic. Show all these people that I am his servant. Show all these people who are speaking against me, their hands should just wither. When people are pointing at you and saying, Nikale, Nikale, their hands just remain like that forever. That would be nice for us, Sindio. We'd just be like, yeah. We want it to be like the story of Moses when Akina Miriam are speaking against Moses. And what happens? Miriam just turns white and leprous. And we want the Lord to do those things. You're like, yeah, I'm serving on the same side as the Lord. So, iwe funzo. Now we may be laughing, but you and I both know that that's a lot of how we are as Christians. When we come into Christianity, we do it because we have the mentality for what's in it for me. I should never go through difficulty. I should just be, he should be at my back and call. The Messiah, the one who is mighty and strong. When I just say, come, he comes. When you ring the bell, he's there. Yes, Zaya, what shall I do to you? That's what we expect of the Lord. When trials and troubles and tribulations are coming. So sometimes John the Baptist may have gotten it a bit confused. You're wondering, we're on the same side. Just come and bust me up, bro. Like, you're my cousin. Like, a lot of us, like John, sometimes we get confused. When we're going through the challenge, when we're going through the fire, we're wondering, why is he not coming? When I was in high school, in Form 1, um, I had just given my life to Christ, so I was a new believer, full of the fire of the Holy Spirit. In fact, just about two weekends before that, I had been filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And let me tell you, buddy, it was something new. I would go into the power room and with the excitement of speaking in a new language, I would just be like, shake it, baby, say, shake it, de, de. You know, when you're learning to speak in tongues, sometimes you only have two syllables, shada, 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 shada. And you're just there. <laughs> I remember Apostle Juma one time mentioning and saying, the thing about the language of the Spirit is that it's a language. Language. The language is supposed to grow. Like a child learns a language and they just say ba 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 ma ma. Then the child, as they are growing, they begin to learn more vocabularies. They begin to know more things. So they begin to make sentences. Then they become phrases. Then they become like whole paragraphs. Then it becomes communication. And after some time, the language begins to morph. The language of people. It's the same about the language of the spirit. When you're starting, you're just like bo 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 bo. But if it is truly the language of the spirit, and you're communicating and speaking mysteries to God, the more you do it, the more you grow in it. It's supposed to be a morphing language. Unajipata now you can pray for an hour and another in the language of the spirit, and you're not just repeating one thing. It becomes a whole dynamic language. What joys are there to be realized in the flow of the Holy Spirit? So I recommend it to you. Praying the Holy Spirit. All right, so as I was praying in the Holy Spirit in the power room, I was just like, 
I was on fire. Boy, I was untouchable. I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. In those days, those prayers you're making, God, if there's anything in my heart that may make me miss you today, kill it, remove it completely. Even if it is my friends, even if it is my family, take them away. I just want to be yours. I don't know what happened to those prayers. <laughs> you guys are judging me, but we see you where you are anyway. I remember this one time in high school, some of our captains, when I was in Form 1, that rule changed, but some of our captains, the, the, the higher-up prefects used to have the ability to punish students. Yeah? Some of you who went to school around my time or older know that that is true. Younger, don't worry, guys. It's, we suffered so that you don't have to suffer. <laughs> so... The dining hall captain at that time, he was Muslim. Um, he came around and I don't know what was happening. The dining hall needed to be rearranged and um, he found people who were slacking. I had already carried, everybody was allocated to carry a table each. So you can't carry a table by yourself. So you So I had already carried my own allotment of table. So I was just hanging around there. Oh, it was entertainment or something. I, I don't remember, something like that. Or oh, the inauguration of Obama. I really don't remember. It was something we needed to watch. So I'd already done my part. So as I'm walking around with my plate, the captain comes in, the dining hall captain, and he's so angry. He's saying, Mono, why are you walking around like that? Before I could open my mouth, I was slapped. I was slapped heavy. Ay, many are the afflictions on the road. I was slapped so hard, I thought to myself, hey, 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 hey. When he's saying, you're just sitting around, my anger was that I have done what I was supposed to do. I have performed all righteousness, yet I am still being punished like the ones who are out there doing nothing. I have done nothing wrong and you're beating me. Me, a believer. Me, a servant of Jesus Christ. You, a Muslim, an unbeliever. Listen to me, buddy. I went into the power room, which was just adjacent there. And Rebecca Talaba, Zibuka, I speak death upon Moha in the name of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, didn't I kill Moha? That was his actual real name. Um, I don't know whether he's, I hope he's alive. Uh, but at least I know by the time we were clearing high school, he still was. Um, <laughs> some of these sermons are scary, uh, dangerous to preach. When, are you guys going to stream that? Just, you know, just cut. And, anyway, I remember praying until I felt like I was turning blue out of loss of circulation of blood to my head. Man, I was praying hard. I was sweating bullets. My knees were hurting, but I was going to take it by force because since the days of John the Baptist come on somebody, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent. I was taking it by force, but I was doing it wrongly. So I was, because I was thinking, no, -uh -uh -uh. you don't touch me. A lot of us wear that chip on our shoulders because we are Christians. We go around thinking, you're driving in tra traffic just like ordinary human beings, and then you're in the right lane. And you're in the right lane. What do you do, my fellow drivers in the house? They're just like, uh 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 uh. Uh -uh, I'm gonna release the holy horns on you. Pee, 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 pee. You're saying things under your breath. You're just mad. You're just wondering what is wrong with this demonic human being. I remember one time I was with one of us in this house. I'm not going to mention their names, but I was the one that was driving. And the first time I was just silent. And then the second time I was like, ah, uh ah, -uh. who's <laughs> So I was just following. You know that thing that causes you to follow that vehicle just so that you can look at that driver and size them down and wonder. So that's what I was doing. Just before we passed them, as I was behind them, I saw the sticker, the ear of the great catch. I knew this is my fellow Deliverance Church brother. <laughs> and I had hooted a good one, my friends. So because we were already speeding and I couldn't now not overtake him because it was either now I overtake him or I hit him in the back. So I just as I was passing, as I looked down, <laughs> I was like, ah, boss. I was like, hello, what is this So they thought that I was hooting because I was chasing them down to say hello. <laughs> Let me tell you, the Lord is kind and gracious. But many of us know we go around our lives as Christians with that chip on our shoulder. We expect the Lord to be... We say that we, the Lord is our master and we are his servants. But really in our hearts, it's the other way around. We expect the Lord to serve us. We expect the Lord, if you listen to our prayers, that's how it is. We are constantly sending God out on errands. We are not feeling the things that we are actually asking the Lord to do. Telling God, go to Moyale and visit those people. God, when you are done with Moyale, come down here and do this thing. God, because you can be 
in many places at the same time. While you're in Moyale, I want you to be in my mother's house, also doing this thing. And God also visit those people who are sick. Because, and when you look at all those things, you're only praying for them so that they can serve you. When you hear there is lack of peace in the Middle East because of the fighting in Israel and Hamas, like in Gaza, you're thinking, ah, you've never prayed about it until they said, because of that fight, the cost of fuel is going to go high. So you are like, the only reason you're praying for there to be peace is so that the prices of fuel do not go up so that your pockets can be okay. We are really just selfish people when you look at our prayer. We are praying, yes, but what is the reason behind our prayer? Many of us are going around with that chip on our shoulder. We expect that the Lord must do this, and when he doesn't do it, I stop praying. I leave the church. I'm no longer talking with him. How can God do such a thing? I've been praying and fasting for five days. Well, the fasting is for you, isn't it? It's not for God. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't have a bearing on God. The fasting does not change God. Because God himself does not eat, does he? What touches the heart of God is what you're doing with your fasting. If you're going to commit yourself to seek him, to seek his face. But also, more than what you're doing with your fasting is why are you doing what you're doing? Why am I seeking to get close to God? Do I have the what's in it for me mentality? Many of us are in this place and we are feeling hurt by God, angry at God, disappointed at God. Why? Because we expected him to do something and he's not holding up his end of the bargain. So many times you will hear yourself in your prayer or in your discussion saying, how can God, why is God doing this to me after I have served him all these years? as if you're serving him for his benefit. Without your service, it's going to fall apart. Listen, guys, I'm not saying that this is not a place of condemnation. It's just a place for us to learn together. Many of us, when we are praying, we are thinking, why would God do this? If you get into, let me just, let me just bring it closer home. If you get into a relationship, and then in that relationship, you all decide, you all ain't doing the deed, you all gonna wait, you all gonna love on Jesus. Y'all go and just read the Bible and pray every day together, hold your hands and become a power couple, you know. And then a few months down the line, the person you thought you were doing this together with is no longer doing it with you. Now you are that whole thing, umtakai akutaki, akutakai umtaki. That thing, you are together, then all of a sudden they decide they're going to leave. So when they leave you, you're so heartbroken because you had already told everybody about your relationship. Your mother knows your mother is now even her bestie. Mama yako waki kukosa anampigia. Simu nasema, sasa kamam, ako hapi? So meachana. Alafu sasa, your mom is still calling her. Anakupakia tu vitu ukirudi Nairobi, anakuambia, pelekea pia kama i daughter hizi vitu. Sama daughter mgani? You know you don't have a sister. Anyway, mkisha achana. And Mertana, because when you're seated down in your heart, in your pain, in your offense, you're asking yourself, why would the Lord do such a thing to me? After I have decided in my heart, I will not, we are not sleeping together, we are not doing anything that will compromise our work in the Lord. Why would the Lord still do that to me? Why would he cause her to do such a thing to me? So what is the next decision? Like, if that is it, sour. Sour, it can be later come, sasa. Ukitoka uku inje, woe to the ladies that are outside here. Because you are a wounded lion that wears a chip on your shoulder. You are a believer that is wounded. Who has wounded you? God. Imagine that. What confusion that the enemy unleashes upon us. So Jesus, in responding to John, says to the disciples, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now Jesus does not say to them, and then he be, eh. No, Jesus gives him proof. Just tell them what you've seen. Tell him what you've seen. Tell him what you've heard. It's the same as us. Whenever you're feeling offended, that's a good pattern that we can find there in Jesus. Just go around people that you know God is doing things in and with or through. A good place is the fellowship of believers. When you're feeling hurt and offended, especially when you're feeling hurt and offended by God, just go around believers. Sit around them. This is not, that is not the time for you to go by yourself. That is not the time for you to call your friends, dust off their contacts who you have never spoken to in how many years, and then now you're calling them. Now you're just like, hey, do you want to chill? 
They are wondering, eh? Why are you coming back to us? That's not the time. That's not the time for you to decide now you're going to just hang around those friends. You used to just... heart by God. And sometimes when we are saying heart by God, it's even heart by God through his people. It's your fellow brother or sister, it's your pastors. You're hurt by Pastor Brian because of something I said when I was preaching. And you're offended because you thought I was talking about you. I mean... Sad so be in a sign language and those other mutuals go offended. That's you consider love than mungo na kuongelesha. I mean, just anyway, if your heart that that's not the time for you to leave the fellowship. And all of a sudden, I don't want anything. Your friends are calling you, they're like, I can you copy or could you fellow and I'm like, ah no, see available. Like you can uko kuingine. That's not the time. That's the time to sit around people and hear what God is doing. See what God is doing. You realize that God is still good. Just the fact that he's not done it for you the way you expected him to do it for you does not mean that he's not good. By the way, do you know that God is not good because he has done good things to us? God is good anyway. That's a good word. You need to turn to your neighbor. Tell them, neighbor, God is good anyway. God's goodness does not depend on you. It does not depend on me. God is good anyway. He is good, period. So he speaks to him and goes to him and says, tell them, what, tell him what you have heard and what you have seen. And then he says in verse 6, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. We can find those two things there. First, that blessed is he who is not offended. There's a friend of mine who, who tells us um, in their place of work, there's something they call the culture of the unof unoffendable heart. And that's a thing that every believer needs to carry within themselves. The culture of the unoffendable heart heart. You do not just be easily offended. When you are walking in a place, people are laughing, you're just offended. You're just like, when you come into church, you see people raising their hands, you're just like, maybe that's the thing that's keeping them alive. Leave people alone. Let people lift their hands. Leave people. Why are you being offended? By the way, we were somewhere yesterday and we were being told. The moment you start to realize other people's joy in the Lord is offending you, that's when you realize you need the joy of the Lord yourself. When other people's relationship with the Lord is bothering you, and restore to me the joy of your salvation because that's an easy proof that you have lost it. So blessed is the one who is not offended. But then again, blessed is the one who is not offended because of me. That when you hear God is not doing things in your life, when you see God is not doing things in your life, you don't carry offense. You can't be offended against God who owns all things, who runs all things, who sees all things. God has perspective above everyone else. As we can only see here, I have given in this youth service many times this example of an aunt, Siafu, Sisimizi, Ambaya Akohapa, on this carpet when the because of the size of its body. aspect ratio. Because it's there. All of this looks like the whole earth. Before it moves from that corner to that corner, what a tiring trek. Great trek. Because of what it is. It can only see here. Us, because we are towering above the ant, we can see this is the church. This is it. Then the person who may be in a helicopter above us can see everything including the tent. You see those drone shots that they show us and they are showing us Shiloh at once, Jewish Shiloh what? They can see the whole of this expanse. They can see Zimmerman, including the main perspective, increases. When you're seated higher and higher above, you're able to see when they have the, all those cameras and those um, things, what are they called? Those things that... The satellites and those super drones. You're able to see everything. You see the way they lift off the earth and you can see when the earth is like a viringo and you can see the waters and the oceans, Ukoju, and then you can see Sijui, what, Sijui, even planets, Sijui, the galaxy. You see those images of the Milky Way galaxy? You're thinking, how did they take that photo? 
and then somebody tries to tell you you are here. You're like, where? Now, God sits above all those things. The Bible will describe him, is it in Job, saying about he sits above the circle of the earth. God has perspective over all things. So while us, your whole life is about here, what I can see, just this. Your whole life is about the people in your life that you can see and that you, that, that, that you know, just a few people. You get into a matatu and you see the, the matatu is a 33-seater. You are only by yourself. You know nobody else. Imagine those are 32 other people with lives that are different from yours. You know nothing about them. You know, know, you know nothing about what they are dealing with. That alone should give you some bit of perspective. And now think there is a God who handles everything single one of these people, including the other seven, or is it now eight billion that are on the surface of the earth, and the people who came before them and the people who will come after them. He has woven them into this beautiful tapestry of life. God has the perspective. So blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Bonais was if you tell your neighbor, neighbor, you can't be offended. So Jesus continues then to speak. After that, now Jesus begins to commend John the Baptist to the people, just to allay those fears, and starts to speak about this great man and what he's doing. He says to them, what did you go out in the wilderness to see, commending John the Baptist? A reed that is shaken by the wind? A man clothed in soft garments? Because those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What did you go out to see? A prophet. And so he's speaking about, then, um, about John the Baptist and continues on and on, even likening him and says that indeed no one is risen that is greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Then he says words that we know, and from the days of John the Baptist, verse 12, he says, and in, um, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom, until now, the kingdom of heaven, come and say it with me, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent, let me just take a minute right here, even though I had alluded to it a little bit earlier. When we're thinking about the kingdom of heaven suffering violence and the violent take it by, uh, by force, this is a place, a phrase of scripture that has been greatly, greatly de um, debated. And it has been made even more complicated by the kind of grammar it is that it uses. That, you know, when you think about violence and you're thinking about power and you're thinking about suffering and all these other things, an easy way of just understanding it is that the kingdom of God will never be received passively. It is always founded on God's work of our, on our behalf. But God's work is always going to produce a response in us. Simply put is this way, guys, that when the kingdom of God has come upon us, it is a great deal that it did not just come upon us lightly. Something had to happen. Jesus had to suffer and bleed and die on that cross. And then on the third day, raise up again. A lot of transactions were made in the background that we may not know in nitty gritty. But all those things resulted to anyone who receives him. That day, he becomes a new creation. Those things result to if you, anyone accepts him, he has everlasting life. All those things happened that transform you from being a sinner who was deserving to die to being now a son of God, a child of the kingdom. So, again, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. I was reading one of the commentaries and, and uh, the story is given there. There's a lady who was a Sunday school teacher and this lady says, uh, she comes complaining to the leader, to her pastor, and she's saying, you know, I don't understand this thing. Every time since I started teaching Sunday school, it has been many years, and I have never experienced a young person give their lives to Christ. So what is all this? It is very heartbreaking. It is very tiring. I've never seen somebody's life transformed. And the pastor was just sharing with her and saying that maybe it, is, it might be because you have not cared to the point of anguish, to the point of violence, to see these young people transformed. An easy way explained is this way, guys. When we're thinking about the things that we're trusting that the Lord would do, those things that are good things that you're asking him to do for you, for your family, for the nation, for the world, for the church, Jesus Christ, and so on and so forth, and you're discouraged about these things not happening, maybe a good place is for us to think about this portion of scripture. The kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. What that would easily mean in the context of the things we are, we're talking about is, what are the things that you care so much for, that you say, I will 
will not move until you do it. There are people who have responses from God of the things they are trusting him for that, re that received the things they are trusting God for. Those are good examples. We find the example of Jacob somewhere wrestling with the angel of God and saying, I will not let you go until until you bless me. That is a good example of the violent take it by force. You sit down and you're saying, I want these things so bad, so much that Lord, by all means, I will stay here until you give it to me. God, I want my life transformed so much. I am willing to do anything you say. I will not leave or get off the course until you do something with me. Are you struggling with something that has taken a long time in your life? You're trying to get answers. You're trying to get a release for the things you're trusting God for. Maybe consider this is a good place to start, that you are so heavily burdened by this thing. You're saying, God, I will not stop until you do something. That's why people go into prayer and fasting for things. That is the attitude that people have. You're saying, God, I am willing to stay away from the foods I like, from the internet entertainment I like, from the internet and social media, from the voices of the world, I am willing to stay away from them so much because I want this thing and I will do everything in my power to get this thing. It is not so that God can see, hey, we are jifinya, we jifinya, we kabla kufe. That's not it. It is for you. It builds discipline inside of us. We sit down and we say, God, if you do not do this thing, I will sit here with you until you either do it or until you do something in me that will cause me to arise and go on my way. But you decide to be the violent, shall take it by force. The Bible will remind us in James chapter 5 and 16 that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We've talked about effective prayer. Effective prayer has to do with many things. Effective prayer has to do with sitting down and planning. You have, um, where is uh, Peter? Peter talked talk to us about uh, digging and reprocessing the wells of prayer. That there has to be a set time of prayer. Fine, some of you will say you don't need to wake up at three and that's okay, but you need to wake up and pray at some point. Let's not get into the argument of, oh, at 12, see you what is happening at three? I don't know what is happening. Is there prayer? Just because if, before you start those arguments, at least make sure you're praying. Before one's exam, to number sangapi. Ah, like in me, me guamka three, guamka three, unataka guamka sangapi, amka yo masaba suombe. I say, hey, miss your bank. Because Babu Mamba guamka three, yeah, three, three. What do you think your life is going to go on? Sawa, ni time gani unaweza? Your answer cannot be hakuna. You must give yourself to a time where you're saying, this is my time. Effective prayer has to do with, before my, prayer, my time of prayer, I, want to, I have decided at least what am I coming to bring to the Lord. I have a list of people that I would want to contend for. I have a few people that I want to pray for their healing. Don't just go, I will just here to have a good time. I'm just the presence of God, sweet, sweet presence of God. That's good. But if you're going to be effective in your prayer, you have planned. It's like you're going to a meeting with somebody who you know can do everything. He has the power to accomplish all things. You're going to that meeting with them. Don't you prepare yourself? Have you seen yourself when you're going for an interview? This is a youth service. You guys know what I'm talking about. Umepanga mafolda yako, mafolda yako. I tell you the truth. One time before I came into full-time ministry, I went to look for a job and the offices were in Runda. And I... Listen... I dressed up. I mean, you know, every once in a while I try to dress up, but that day I dressed up. I put things together. I was ready. I had ironed my shirt twice in the night and in the morning. I was like, ooh, you guys don't even know. I had a tie. I hardly wear ties, but I had a tie. This one was coincidental. I wasn't going to, put the, to give the example. In the you are buried, you guys. Anyway, um... I had a tie, I prepared myself, I presented myself to the interview. Um, what I had not gotten was the memo that people usually organize their things in folders. So I had my brown envelope. You guys know the brown envelope? The big A4 brown envelope, nimerusha ma document, okay, ma certificate, kondani, nimerusha, kila kitu. I had not received my certificate from graduating, so I had my transcripts, nimerusha, kondani. Then I am walking inside there with the gate of, you know, a working man, working class. I remember walking into the place, and these ladies were just walking in their high heels, and they were just like, hello, hi, everyone. I'm wondering, wow, this one must be nice. I love when I get in, I realize, ala, ata hawa mekujei kazi inataka. Hey, no ma, no ma, no ma, angori, bro. <laughs> we are fighting for the same thing. 
when I get up in their nice high heels and their two dresses and they just are sitting down like the queen crossing their legs at their ankles with their two folders, I'm like, hey, it's in a folder, and charge it to our marks. They're just, and it was almost always the ladies. I mean, the ladies, the Lord bless you. You people are organized. You have an upper hand over us in that one. My brother, Lazima to Jitu, my brother. Lazima. So um, I was like, okay. What I do not have in folders, I will make up for in my grammar. Okay. I'm going to walk into that room and I'm going to wow them with my grammar. Okay. My English language is going to sound great. Okay. And then one of them just asked me, hello, um, what school did you go to? I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you are going to British English. Like I said, we? Kizungu yangu ya kutoka South Mississippi. Carolina, there's a place in Embu called Carolina. Kama mnajua Embu, lakini inaise manga Carolina. So, uh, and my mom comes from there. So, ambia kizungu yangu ya kutoka Carolina, bana itaweza, itatoboa, hii kitu. Duke of Edinburgh. Anyway, okay, I'm here, so I didn't get the job clearly. Um, <laughs> but I remember the lesson that I learned because the interviewers were so kind, so kind, super kind. Those of you who are here and you have positions in your offices where you sit in panels and you can employ people, don't just send somebody out with hopes and dreams that you're going to call them. And you know for sure, nobody on that panel is going to even look at those papers again. Don't be wicked. Help this person in the journey. What can they do for their next job? I have enrolled the whole church into praying for me. We are waiting for an answer. And you know for sure you are not waiting for anything. Prepare me. Um, unfortunately, we may not give you the answers right now, but uh, as, you, as you wait, just, you know, um, in the future, consider dressing like this. They, used to, they, they gave us even tips on how to dress. So apparently, I was overdressed for the interview. Okay, I knew I had overdone because, I mean, I had the half coat. I, I was dressed like I was going to a wedding. I had the lapel. I had the chains. You know those chains in Anguka Ivish? Just you're walking. I mean... <laughs> so they told me maybe when you're considering for a corporate job maybe just you know don't don't underdress but also don't overdress they gave me great advice then the final thing they told me was consider getting a folder with pages for your document so that when you ukiulizwa umezipanga na chronological order kutoka certificate ya baby class kama utaibeba you carry what you want lakini kama ianzie huku mbele ukisonga hivi hadi huku nyuma watu wapi mko wapi I'm just playing. Anyway, so they, they gave me some advice on what to do. And I realized the people, because they needed two people, the people who got it were both ladies. They were very smart. They were very smartly dressed. They had their nice folders and whatever, and so on and so forth. When you're going to get a job, when you're going to meet with people who are important, you panga your thoughts. I remember, I remember many times when I am called into the office, easy mambo ya kitambo, ini mambo ya recent, ongoing, current. Every time I'm called to the office by Bishop, every time I'm called to the office by Pastor Alice, especially by Pastor Alice. Pastor Alice is meticulous. You guys know Pastor Alice is meticulous. If you know, you know. Now, when I can nod their heads. If she's calling you into a meeting, you go organized. Ukona kitabu, ukona nini. Many times she will tell you, open a fresh page. This idea is for a fresh page. So I'm like, open a fresh page. So you can like, okay, fresh page. And then you start. You are writing, you are writing. Unajipanga. If that is what we are willing to do when we are going to human beings, how much more when we are going to present our cases before the God who is able to do all things? You must be meticulous about your planning, the effective prayer looks like effectiveness. You plan for it, there is a set time, I have organized myself, I am not going to God just before I fall asleep, just before I am falling asleep. Unajua zile simu unaongea nganazo za usiku, au kwa shua kama likata simu, kama tuliambia na goodnight, si kwa shua, umeamkatua subuhi na days. Nilisema goodnight, tusema unangalia simu, isi muilisha sangapi. See, you can't go to God, that is not effective. Effective is that you know you're giving God your best time. That's why people recommend the morning. You're fresh. 
please, I'm not telling you that you're about to do it deep, spiritual, the heavens are open. Eka yo kando. Nimesema, before we get to things, effectiveness ni kujipanga. You go to God when you're fresh, when your mind is crisp. Even when the Lord is speaking to you, you know, easy ugali, ju ugali iko digested tayari ya jana usiku. Saa hizi Mungu ananinenea. Hii unaenda kwa Mungu umechoka, umeshiba. Hata uwezi ukaketi vizuri in the place of prayer umejiwekelea hivi. Hata hapana, atambia jirani yako acha maio ni maneno bana. Effective prayer looks like umeketi umejipanga. You have prepared for it. Then it says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man. What does fervent mean? Fervent means hot. Fervent means heartfelt. I am feeling what I am asking God to do. That if God does not do that thing, I will feel the effects. And not just me. The kingdom will also feel the effects. Our problem is that many times we are asking God to care for things that we don't even care about. That means our prayer is just so-so. Even when you're telling somebody, oh, I'm going to pray for you. Oh, your mom is sick. I'm going to pray for you. You will never follow up on whether that mama got sick or got healed. You will never follow up on whether that mama is still in hospital. You will never follow. You, you don't care about it. You just say, oh, I'll pray for you because it is our Christian duty. Oh, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. That prayer is not fervent. It's not heartfelt. It's not hot. You know what the hot prayers are like? I want you to consider that time when you are feeling heartbroken and you just sat like this in the presence of God and you're like, where? The youth committee knows about the, the times we talk about making Aki God prayers. You guys know Aki God prayers? You sit in the presence of God and you're like, hey, Aki God. Hey, Aki God. Have you been character developed in this Nairobi? Or oh, some of you don't know me. That day never come in Jesus' name. Some of us have been. Have you ever been left? <laughs> guys in the booth know what being left looks like. Unachwa unasikia ni kama how do I live without you? How can I breathe without you? There is no me without you. Ulko umeshaambia watu wote hivyo umepost social media unajua kuna kuachwa na kuna kuachwa ya lazima uende uka clean social account yako. Juu zile picha mlikuwa bay need a bay wow unaenda una select kila kitu ama I'm going in hibernation. <laughs> you sit in the god and you've seen those memes Mtu anafungua page, alafu umeandika dear God, alafu tu tear drops. You've seen that meme? Yeah. Those are heartfelt prayers. The Bible says, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us in groans that are too deep for words. Is that Romans 8 and 26? Umeke TV kuwepo wa You're just like, hey, 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 Jesus. Hey, hey. Roho wa Mungu anakuhurumia anakuja anachukua hiyo A yako anaipeleka kwa uwepo wa Mungu. Bwana anaiangalia anaiona hii imekuwa interpreted anasema oi bwana saidia. <laughs> Now think about that prayer and then think about how many prayers do you make fervently? How many prayers are you willing to make violently by force? That you may lay a hold. We have said violently by force is not ilea tunengi unangangana. You are asking for the death of people. You are asking that the makanga. Kasa babu umekatana change yako na amekutukana. Mewamea nunua yako. Unasema God, give me a car tomorrow. So that when I ride in, he will see that truly. Ati landlord amekufungia nyuma. Mewamea enda uko ukajenge yako. Unasema God, by your miraculous power, I speak a house. Asa ata nyumba, ata... Tell your neighbor it's not time yet. A lot of the things we are asking God for, it's not time yet. We don't even know how the answers look like. You watch your child, watoto kwa estate. Wanacheza, wanacheza mmoja, anagongwa na mwingine. Anaenda, alafu, anatoka na wambia. Nenda kuambia baba yangu, baba yangu ni police. Na ni ukweli baba yake ni police, ni najua. Anambia baba yangu ni police, hata nipia gana, tukuja kushoot. And you go back and you overhear the child telling the dad, Daddy, ni pati a gun, ni kawa, shoot. What does the dad do? Give them a gun. Asama, wame kifanya nini? Chukua. Kimbia. Kimbia. The dad doesn't do that. How do you expect if us who are human beings know how to look at the issues and the requests of people around us and we know how to meet at them? How do you expect that God is going to deal with these requests that we bring to him? That's why you don't have the house yet. 
That's why you don't have your car yet. Because God knows that car is not for his glory. It is for you to just ride into the estate with your windows rolled down with a boom twaf going all the way crazy. People cannot sleep. Unapita kando wa gadis ngini wambia mungu ni patia so baru GT. Ndiyo nikigia ukondrrrr alafu ikona zile ma twa. Gari kwa estate zile ndogo. There is no peace in the estate. Why would God give you that instrument of disturbance? Utakaka bila gari brave. But when you're thinking kingdom, when you're thinking kingdom-mindedness, the prayer requests you're making are kingdom as well. You know if the Lord answers this one, the kingdom, iwekula fiti. Bwana sifiwe. Jamani bwana iso sifiwe. We're not able to finish because my time is up. But Jesus says one more time, most assuredly I say unto you, that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. I want to pause it right there and call it by faith, part one. But I want you to take a moment right now, just lift up your voice and ask the Lord to transform your heart, that you would be, number one, not easily offended, that you would not be confused with the chip that you wear on your shoulder because you're a Christian, do not go around terrorizing people with the words you're speaking, that your expectations will not be expectations that look to the suffering of other people and only to the benefiting of your own. But that number two, he would cause you to be kingdom-minded, that you would think about the things that would be of benefit to the kingdom, things that would be of benefit to the people around you, that if the Lord answered your prayer, that not only your life would be transformed, but the life of the church, the life of the people around you, and around you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. We thank you for your word that has come forth to us today. I will receive it with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. Pray that, Lord, you would follow up your word inside of us to perform it, that there would be a complete performance of the things that you promised concerning us. We do not want to be easily offended, Lord Jesus. We do not want to be offended because of you. Help us, O oh God, to follow you, to listen to you, Help us to come to you with these things. To come to you, Lord God Almighty. Where we are struggling, help us to come to you, O oh God, that we'll not just ask you to care for things that we don't even care about, but that we would be effective about it, showing that we care about these things, enough to plan for them, that we would be fervent about the things we're asking you for in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask that you would Start us up and start us up our, start up our faith that we'll be more and more like you in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh God, even as we look forward to this week that is coming, that we'll not just be hearers only, but that we'll also be doers of the word. Help us to go around carrying upon our hearts the idea, the thought, the truth, and the reality of the kingdom of God, not just ourselves, not just us being selfish-minded, but that we'll think about us and how our actions are affecting others, and how your kingdom is glorified. Because we pray these things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, put your hands together, celebrate the name of Jesus.